Amazing. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? You doing good? Good. Awesome. So, um, oh, look at that. Um, so, like Ben said, my name is Jacob Kemp. I'm sorry I haven't met everybody here yet, but you know, this is my, my, my formal apology to everybody. I'm Jacob Kemp. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm married to the amazing Rachel Kemp, who helped lead us in, in worship this morning. Um, and it's my honor to be able to be chatting with you guys for the next, you know, 20 um, to 30 minutes. Um, I don't know about you guys, but, um, but I'm one of those people who always has, you know, like a running to-do list in my head. You know, you could call it like an almost like a have-to list. You know, always things that I have to do. You know, we've got, you know, we've got, you've got people you need to talk to, emails I need to send, you know, cat litter I need to buy, you know... Um, <laughs> All of these different things that are just running through my head. And I remember when Apple first brought out the, um, the Reminders app on the, on the iPhone. All the iPhone users, I'm sure, know what it is. So basically, I could, just, I could just word vomit all of my thoughts into this app, and it would remind me at different times, at different locations, um, when to do all of the things that were just stuck in my mind. And this almost works, but still in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, what do I have to do tomorrow? So that's my question to you guys. Turn to the person next to you and ask them, what do you have to do tomorrow? Right, I think when it goes quiet, that means that people are running out of things to say. So um, today we begin our very important, very exciting new series called Bless. Let me hear you say bless. 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 Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, And today's message is called um, The Jesus Mission. So to get started, what did you say was on your, your, your to-do list, your, your have-to list tomorrow? I think the key word here is have. What did you have to do. Maybe you need to be somewhere. Maybe you need to, you know, finish off work that you didn't manage to get finished on Friday. And, and I feel like there are always so many things going on in our minds that it can almost feel, you know, overwhelming. And I think C.S. Lewis kind of puts it in a really um, good way. In, in his book, Mere Christianity, he says this, each morning when you wake up, all of your wishes and your hopes rush at you um, like wild animals. You know, and how right is that? I mean, I know it is for me, but most of the time it's not, you know, the wishes and hopes, but it's that massive to-do list. You know, the first thing you wake up and you're like, dang it, I need to, you know, pay that bill and I need to do the budgets. I need to send an email. I need to, to call that person. There are always, you know, same, you know, the same old stuff that you, you have to do. Or maybe you just wake up thinking that you're a, a little bit allergic to mornings um, and you go back to sleep for another 30 minutes. <laughs> Um, I know back in, in high school, I remember being stuck in that, that same old cycle, you know. I remember, you know, you'd wake up out of the same old bed, you'd walk down the same old stairs, you would eat the, the same old breakfast, get in the same old car to get, catch the same old school bus, miss the school bus, drive the, the long drive to school, um, you know, with the same old teachers, same old lessons, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. You know, and maybe you look back at your life and think of, of times that were like that when you're almost stuck in a cycle of the same old, or maybe if you're honest and with yourself that maybe you feel a little bit like that today. You know, you just have a long list of things that you have to do, but without, without actually any passion or purpose. Um, too many people think that that's how you have to do life, but I don't know about you guys, but I don't want the same old. I want to wake up every morning with passion and purpose and all my wishes and hopes to rush at me like, like wild animals, like um, C.S. Lewis says. I mean, sure, there are things that we have to do. We're, we're all adults here. Um, but I believe by God's design that there are also things that you have to do. Not just have to do, but have to do. I believe that God birthed, when he birthed you, he birthed you with dreams. He birthed you with purpose. He birthed you with vision, with things that only you have to do, things that you must do with your life. And I'm sure you'll all agree as Christians that as Jesus followers, we're called to share his light. We're called to share his love with the people who are around us. And, uh, and if you're journeying with us over the next five weeks of this series, our hope is that you'll discover a mission that is so compelling that you simply have to do it. Anyways, enough from me. We're going to be reading from um, the Bible, which is a pretty cool book. Um, and we're going to be reading from John chapter 4. So if you want to grab your Bibles or your phones, whatever you've got, I'm going to be starting um, at verse 4. So John chapter 4, verse 4. Awesome. Let's start. Verse 4 says, now he had to go through Samaria. Let's, let's pause there for a second. I know it's just getting interesting. Um, I think this part of the story often goes... Unnoticed. I know I had noticed it until, you know, I started prepping for this talk. It says Jesus had to go through Samaria. And I think we can look at it, you know, in one of two ways. You know, we can look at it in one way, you know, like it was the same old, you know, that was just what he had to do. You know, he had to go through Samaria. Or we can look at it in, in, in a different light. 
you know, change that had to a had. Jesus had to go through Samaria because there was a compelling cause, because um, there was something inside of him saying, I have to go there, that this is the next step in my journey. And I'm sure most of you guys know this, but just to recap, Jews and Samaritans, they did not get on. They were enemies and they hated each other. And few people here would argue the fact that um, a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. You have to get from A to B, you go in a straight line. So to go from Galilee, where, you know, where Jesus was, to go to Judea, if you went through Samaria, it would take three days. But if you went around it, it would take an extra two days. And that journey you know, was, was way more dangerous. There's, there's robbers and bandits um, waiting to you know, attack people. Uh, the journey was way more difficult, but Jews would actively avoid Samaria. So when the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, you know, what makes this story so out of the ordinary is he didn't have to go through Samaria. He could have taken the route that every other Jew took. But no, Jesus had to go through Samaria because of the mission that God had given him. There was a woman he just had to meet. So let's jump back into our, packet, uh, our passage um, we're at uh, verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, um, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Random little fact for you there. Um, the Samaritan woman said to him, um, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans, just like we said before. Jesus answered her, answered her if you knew that the, the gift that of God and who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Um, as did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become um, in them a spring of water welling up in eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you have is not your husband. What, have you, what you have said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but Jews claim that the place we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet time is coming, and has now come, when true worship... Uh, for, uh, I've got lost, here we go. Yeah, time is coming and has now come when true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and his worshippers must worship in Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. So Jesus meets this Samaritan woman at the well. She was there at a very strange time of day when no one else was there. A uh, little fact, back in these times, all of the, the women would, from the village or the town would go to the well at the same time. It was, it was almost like a very social experience. They would go and hang out and chat about their day as they, as they collected um, water. But for this particular woman, it was like she was trying to avoid being noticed. As we just read here, she had been married five different times and guy number six she was currently living with was not her husband. She was someone it looked like had been rejected by the rest of her community. And it was for her that Jesus said, I have to go where no one else wants to go. He was on a mission. He was going to reach her. He was going to restore her. He didn't care that she was a Samaritan. He didn't care that she was a woman who the rest of the community obviously thought had a bit of a dodgy past. He didn't care that the rest of the community had rejected her and went out of their way to avoid her. Jesus went out of his way to meet her. Let's jump back in at verse 29. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back out into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Jesus not only engaged her in conversation, he treated her with dignity and he loved her. 
And in doing so, Jesus changed her life. She went from being someone who came to the well at the hottest time of day to avoid being noticed by anyone to a woman so consumed by the love of Jesus that she went back into town to tell everyone about this life-changing experience that she had. Like we just read in verse 29, her media um, reaction to encountering the love of God was not to hold it into herself, not to hold it just and keep it to her, but it was to go out and tell everybody else about it, even the people who had rejected her. And finally, if we go all the way down to verse 39, it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. That's pretty amazing. I think this very famous story helps show us three things. The first thing, we discover that Jesus had a mission. Jesus himself had a cause that was so compelling that he woke up every single day saying, I know what I have to do. Second, we discover that we too have a mission. As Jesus follows, his mission is our mission. So we too have a compelling cause. We have something that we have to do. And lastly, we discover that Jesus' mission is made up of three life-changing parts. So our first part is um, reach. Let me hear you say reach. 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 Awesome. And it's about reaching people who are far from God. Reaching the lost. In the story we looked at, the Samaritan woman was far from God. By far from God, I don't think that that means she wasn't spiritual. I don't think that means that she wasn't looking. And, you know, it may not even believe that she didn't believe in God or, or a God. I think a lot of the people from that time believed in God or a God. You could tell by the questions that she asked, she was searching for something or for someone. Like every single one of us does at some point in our lives. But what do we do to find fulfillment in? You know, is it money? Is it power? Is it sex? Is it drugs? Is it a job? Is it success? Is it a husband, a wife, your kids? She was searching, but she hadn't found out yet what it was she was supposed to be searching for. I think that's why Jesus was there. And um, my story, um, I'll share that with you guys just for a little bit. I think it can relate a little bit to that. Um, I was brought up in a Christian family. My parents are amazing. Uh, we all moved to Mexico when I was 11 years old, uh, which was awesome. My parents are missionaries out there. They're still out there today. They build houses for families who can't afford to build um, houses for themselves. So I'd always known who God was. I remember when I was seven years old, I remember um, I watched Pinocchio, which apparently was scary back then, because um, I, I woke up that night from a nightmare. Um, and uh, something about a whale and being trapped, um, it was kind of scary. Anyways, um, and my nan came rushing into the room and she, she sat me down, calmed me down and prayed with me. And I remember and I prayed a prayer and I seen God to become a part of my life. But throughout my teenage years, I think I only sort of half got him. I kind of got that he was God and that he created me, that he loved me, that was supposed to worship and pray. But I couldn't connect that with my everyday life. There were there, and, and, and there's a longing in, in all of us, you know, a, a longing for something. And if we don't fill that longing with God, then something else will. So throughout my teenage years, that, that was a bit of my life. I was, I was in this cycle of, 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 you know, going from one thing to the next, whether that was partying, whether that was drinking, that was, whether that was friendships, whether that was girls, anything that other people were doing that I could get involved in. And it wasn't really until I was 18 when I moved to Manchester. I just remember being floored by the magnitude of God and his, his grandness and his love for me. I remember um, I just spent like an entire week just crying on the floor of my bedroom, just asking God to, to fill me with his forgiveness and love. And, and, and every day there are people like I was. Every day there are, there are people that we meet that, um, that are like the Samaritan woman. You know, there are our families, there are our friends, there are our co-workers, the people that we see on the street. And Jesus wants us to reach them. Our mission is to reach them. Jesus reached out to the Samaritan woman. He's now asking us to reach out to the people who are around us. So if our first point is is reach, and it's about, you know, reaching people, our second point is restore. Let me hear hear you say restore. 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 Awesome. You guys are cool. Um, And it's about restoring God's dream for this world. You know, God's dream and his desire for all of us, for each and every human being is to be in a perfect relationship with him. 
You know, like it talks about in the beginning in, in Genesis in chapter 3, verse 8, you know, when it says that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's how God intended the world to be, you know, a perfect world without sin, without destruction, evilness or greed. And obviously we don't know the full story of the Samaritan woman. We know that she had had five husbands, that the guy number six that she was hanging out with was not her husband. Um, and so we know there were people in the Samaritan's woman life who maybe claimed to have loved her, but in the end only used her. Because of that and because of the choices that she made, that perfect dream that God intended for her life was, was shattered and, and in pieces, waiting for a savior, waiting for Jesus to come you know, and, and restore her and put those pieces back together. And there are so many people around us with lives like her, living lives in situations that are so much less than what God dreamed of. In truth, some people because of their choices, but there's also some people because of, you know, the unjust people who are around them who should have loved them. You know, maybe it's that person that you pass on the street every day when you go to work who's, who's been living there for the past few months. Maybe it's that person you meet who's got, you know, an addiction who's, who's yet to hit rock bottom. You know, some of the people are, are, are people who've been cast aside and forgotten. Maybe it's that single mom and dad that you know that's trying to raise kids on, on, a, on a tiny salary. Or, or the refugee who is alone and, and, and escaped their war-torn country to come here and find a place and a home and make life for themselves. Anytime you see someone living a condition or a circumstance that is so much less than God dreamed of, know this. Jesus wants to restore God's dream for their life. So my question is, could we partner with God and see it as our mission to reach and restore them? Yeah. So we start with reaching and restoring, and, and the third and final point is this, is lastly, is, is reproducing that mission in the lives of others. Because that's exactly what happened in the life of the Samaritan woman, isn't it? Let's jump back to, to verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's, that woman's testimony. I think that's absolutely amazing. The story doesn't end at her. She takes the good, life-changing news out into her community, even to the people who would obviously despise her, the people who had obviously avoided her. Her change is instant, and her instant response is, I know what I have to do. I think of us reaching and restoring, of us telling people about Jesus and his life changing transformation um, simply stops at them that I think we're not preaching it quite right. We want to see disciples making disciples. We want to see people who bless people, who bless people, who bless people. Um, and and um, as some of you guys know, I work for a Christian charity called The Message Trust. Um, I'm in a band called Brightline, and we get to travel across um, the UK, sometimes into Europe, going into schools and prisons. And a really cool thing we do is we get to invite the people that we meet from schools um, to gigs and just, you know, just preach the gospel to them. It's amazing. Um, and about um, a couple of years ago, I remember um, this story that, that one of the kids from the gigs got saved, which is always amazing. Um, but then the, the following Sunday, what happened was they'd taken, you know, their mum and their grandma to church uh, audacious in town. You see, that decision did not stop at that, that kid who got saved. They, they went out to tell their mum, and their mum went out to tell their grandma, and then that, now that entire family is changed by the transformative love of Jesus. Yeah. You know, this story is the same as the S Samaritan woman. Her change is instant, and, her instant and, and the instant response was, I know what I have to do. Guys, so whatever you discover is, is your, your mission, whether that you, you feel like every day you're supposed to be out on the streets telling people about Jesus, then maybe bring somebody along with you, you know, impart into them, you know, train them up, whether you go to soup kitchens on a Friday night or, or a homeless shelter, bring people along with you. Because for this mission to be accomplished, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to reproduce it in others. We can't change the world by ourselves, but by partnering with God and the people around us. We can have a good try, can't we? Yeah, on, yes. Um, so in this story, we saw uh, Jesus' mission was what? It was, it was to reach, it was to re restore, and it was to you know, reproduce that in others. So, um, so over the summer, we're going to be switching things up a bit, like, like Ben has already said, where instead of looking inside of the church at all the beautiful faces around you, we're going to be looking um, outside of the church. How can we make Jesus' mission 
our mission. And I think this series is going to be the launch pad of what's to come in the next few weeks. So in that, I wanted to uh, challenge you guys with three points. Two easy ones and um, one slightly harder one. First point is this. First little challenge is, um, like Ben has already said, we want you guys to, to join um, this Bible plan with us. We think it was going to be so important as we read through the book of Acts. It starts tomorrow, so make sure you guys get the app. Make sure you download version, or make sure you get the Bible app, which, whichever way you're going to do it, or just read it in your own Bible. I think it's going to be so important, so amazing to be able to read through this book of Acts together. Um, as, as we're all reading the same things, I think God could be doing um, amazing things in this church and the people around us. Um, we also want to encourage you guys to commit to actually being here over the next um, five Sundays. So maybe that you need to um, uh, put those in your diary. Like I said, this series is called Bless and it's going to run the next five weeks. Um, and we really think you guys are going to be inspired and empowered by the life of Jesus and his ministry while he was here on earth. Um, and the, the slightly harder challenge is this, the third one, is, um, is I want you guys to get out your phones. Pause for a second. Um, I want you to open up a note, um, or if, you, if you're old school, got pen and paper, then good for you, grab those as well. Um, and, um, and I'd love you to, um, to see um, who you're going to reach this, this summer. I'd like you to, to write down five names, actually, of people that, that you feel like God is calling you to reach. You know, reaching this scenario could look different to every single name and person on your list. Maybe you simply just want to commit to, you know, going out of your way to, you know, to talk, somebody, talk to somebody, to, 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 to befriend them. Make them feel like there is a world full of people out there, and, and I chose you. You know, there was thousands of people in Samaria, in it, and, um, and Jesus chose her. It could simply look like helping somebody move house or, you know, going around to someone's house once a week and making them dinner, bringing them dinner, doing a food shop for them. Maybe you want to babysit for them. My question is, is, is who is it you're going to matter to um, for the, each and every one of these names? And I think it'll be easy to, you know, hurriedly write down five names, you know, put your phone in your pocket and never think about it again. Um, so I wanted um, us to just uh, chuck some music on and, and just pray just for simply two minutes and see who God wants you to, to reach this summer.